Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is a privilege to read your words, to hear your witnesses describing you, to be called to be your witnesses. Lord, would you make us true to you, make us true witnesses. I pray, Father, for the power of your Holy Spirit to move among us, to move in us, to inspire us, to correct us, to lead us. I pray that you will speak through me. And Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. So we're starting a new teaching program, and it's called Perfect Church! Exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark. Is that laughable? Perfect church. Is that questionable? Is that something we understand? Is that something we should look for? What do we know about how a church could be perfect? And the teaching program is going to be working through the book of Acts. Uh, People call it Acts for short. It's originally the Acts of the Apostles. A couple of centuries ago, people started saying, well, really, is it about the Apostles or is it about the Holy Spirit? Maybe we should call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Some people, because they think Acts is too short, like to call it the Acts, but that sounds strange in a sentence. I was looking at the Acts. It doesn't come across quite right. So I'm calling it Acts. We're going to work through Acts, and we're going to consider, we're going to think about the perfect church. What is the perfect church? Is the perfect church attainable? And the thing we're looking at this morning is Acts chapter 1. Now, we didn't read out the first five verses. You can read those at home. I've sent out a little thing on the city. If you're not on the city, you need to get on the city. It's really helpful. It gets lots of information. The, with a little thing about which verses to read, I'm hoping people will follow the whole of the book of Acts through the next three months so that we, we read every verse of it. But in church, we're going to read the bits that we're actually concentrating on. So the first five verses, Luke, the author, covers what he's already said in the Gospel of Luke. Now, nobody doubts that Luke's the author of both of these books. Okay, so Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote Acts almost as if it was the same book continuing on. Some people think they're one book cut in two, two books. And he recaps what he said at the end of the Gospel. He recaps the Gospel. Then he describes the Ascension, which is also in the Gospel. He describes what Jesus says to his disciples. The disciples go to Jerusalem. They appoint a replacement for Judas Iscariot. That's our chapter. That's chapter one this morning. So, perfect church. What is your perfect church? Do you have a picture of what a perfect church might be? Does your perfect church look a bit like this? Do you think? That's kind of attractive. It's kind of exciting. There's 35,000 people in that church. It's a mega church. Is that a perfect church? Because lots of people go, must be doing something quite good. God bless them, I say. Is that your perfect church? Or is this your perfect church? There's lots of uh, ceremony. There's lots of glory there. Did you grow up in a church like this? When you think of church... Do you wish we had a few more candles? I don't know. <laughs> don't know. I don't know. I'm not actually rhetorical questions. Let's not start a debate on that one. <laughs> Is your perfect church this? A group of people studying the word in a home, sharing, fellowship, prayer, learning. Or is your perfect church this? Christians doing, Christians being out there, doing the work that Jesus called us to. Or is your perfect church? Ah. There's a joke amongst ministers. Teachers share it as well. Church would be an awful lot easier if it had no people in it. (laughs) Teachers say it about schools. There's probably a lot of people (laughs) that could pass that one on. There's a lot of churches like this. And it can be very nice to pray in an empty church, to just have that silence and space. Is that your idea of a perfect church? Now, for lots of us, the, our idea of a perfect church is probably what we grew up with or where we came to faith. We get this thing stuck in our brain at that moment. I do. So the church I grew up in was 
really very charismatic, had a lively band. It was an old Victorian Anglican church, and they st- did communion with a communion rail and kneelers. And for a very long time, when I left, when I went to university and m- looked at other churches, I was quite critical of other churches because they weren't like this church. Because it's actually quite difficult to get that combination together, do you know, to put those things together. I still feel quite nice kneeling for communion. It's my habit. It was put into me when I came to faith. It's the church I was saved in. It was the church I was born again in. Do you know, it's deep impact on me. I also started feeling a complete lack of my youth worker's favorite song. Do you know, because he loved that song so much we used to sing. Father God, I wonder how I... Did you have that one? Manage to... Oh, we're going to have to have that one. <laughs> Curlin, can you learn that one? That's what we sang, every youth group, and it touched me deeply. It's beautiful. Do you know? Other churches had different things. You move around, you go to these churches, and you think, oh, that's not right. He's not wearing the right clothes. That's not right. I'm not sitting in the right kind of seat. That's not right. The things are in the wrong order. Do you know? We've got this thing in the back of our brains that can kind of cloud us because we, which is shaped by that. Lots of it's positive, and it's happened through history with each denomination of the church. Do you know? The early Roman Catholic church was trying, reaching to be the church Jesus wanted them to be, to be the perfect church. Then they had an argument with the Greeks. They had a schism, 1054. Church splits. The Orthodox church must have thought, we're going to do it better. We've got this right. We're going to be the perfect church. Then more happens and more happens. We get to the Reformation. Church has got somewhat corrupt. We've got a better church. We'll do it better. Lots of Reformation churches start. We're going to be the perfect church. We pinned it down to what it should be. Then time goes by and the the Puritans think they can do it better. The Baptists think they can do it better. The Methodists think they can do it better. The Pentecostal movement. We're going to get it just right this time. The Pentecostal movement is like a third coming, second coming, a new Pentecost. Do you know? It's all happening. Forget all those third coming, second comings. That was completely out of order. They felt a movement of the Holy Spirit. They started a church which they believed could be better than what was there before. They, you heard of the Vineyard Church? Even the Vineyard Church has had a little split. I went to the Toronto Airport Church when I was 18, and that was Toronto Vineyard Church, and now it's Catch the Fire. Do you know, each time somebody's saying, we can make this the perfect church, we can make this a bit better, we can improve And a lot of the churches that do this go back to this book. They go back to Acts. They say, well, how was it at the beginning? Because surely this is like the best way it can be. The disciples are just trained. Do you know? Jesus has just set them up. They are full of the flush of youth. They are the first manifestation of Jesus' mission. The Holy Spirit is moving among them. There's miracles among them. The way they do church here must be the best example, like a perfect church. Now, it's also debatable whether we should even give the title to this chapter, Jesus Creates the Church. Because when did Jesus create the church? This is the point where Jesus leaves. He leaves his disciples and says, get on with it. But you could say, well, maybe Jesus started the church when he called Peter. Do you know, there he is calling his first follower. Did the church start then? Other people would often say the church started at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. But we're basically in this area where Jesus is leaving his people to get on with his work. So we're going to look through Acts and we're going to ask, how can we be the church Jesus wants us to be? What was the church that Jesus called into being? What did he want then and what does he want of us here and now? Us in this community, this fellowship. Now the first little problem is the word church. The word church can cause a little bit of difficulty because people use the word church differently. They use it for different things. They use it to describe their experiences. But also there's some debate over whether it's the right translation in the Bible. So, so the authorized version, the King James Version, translates this word church, which is the word we're used to. It made sense when they did that. But the word here is ecclesia, which is more assembly, the assembly of the followers of Jesus. And you can make it complicated. 
Or you can make it nice and simple. And you just look at this thing and say, well, how can we be the assembly that Jesus wants us to be? How can we be the people that Jesus wants us to be? How can we be his body, his family, his disciples, his growing kingdom, the people Jesus set up to carry his work? Let's have a look at the passage. So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? I'll read it if you can't. <laughs> it's the orange bits that are more important. Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, it's funny that Calvin says, in that one question, there's as many errors as there are words. Not quite sure. That's a bit cutting. But they, they've clearly, in that question, not quite got where Jesus is wanting them to go. Do you know, there, there's lots of things that they're missing there. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. There's three things here. Bigger print. Everyone can see it. Jesus tells them that they need to wait to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells them that they are to be witnessing to him. They are to be witnesses to Jesus. They are to be witnesses to his resurrection. And then after he's left, they get, it feels to me, a little bit like an angelic rebuke. The angels come down and say, what are you doing looking up there? There's nobody there. You're not, you shouldn't be looking at the sky. Go and get on. Go and get ready. Look busy. Jesus is coming. Get ready for the second coming. Jesus is going to return the way you saw him leave. So they do as they're told. They go to Jerusalem. It's about a kilometer away because that's about a Sabbath's journey. Then they talk. They realize there's only 11 disciples. They come up with a method for choosing a replacement for Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, who's killed himself, who's betrayed Jesus. They believe they need a 12th replacement. So they use quite a good criteria. They say, we'll go for those who knew Jesus, who witnessed from baptism to ascension, to when he left us. So they understood what Jesus was calling them to do, and they wanted somebody who could do that. Then they prayed. They asked Jesus for guidance. Then they drew lots. That's not really how we do things now, is it? We'll just do it by drawing lots. Who's, who's pulled the shortest straw? You're the disciple. Now, I've wondered about this. There's, there's a few people that wonder about this. I'm not, I don't think it's heresy to wonder, were they doing this in their own strength? Should they have waited a bit longer? Do you know, before they chose the replacement, should they have waited for the Holy Spirit? And uh, it's pretty clear that Luke doesn't think so. So we're good with Matthias being the 12th disciple. But then as you go through, you see Paul is there. Paul is an apostle. Perhaps they should have waited. If they'd received the Holy Spirit, then they, they'd have got it. That's just a kind of query. So, what Jesus is doing as he talks to them before he ascends to heaven is leaving them with something new. He's giving them something new. And the newness is all in what he tells them. He's telling them the new thing is power. You will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. The new thing is you, you are witnessing to Jesus. It's Jesus. The new thing is you are preparing for his return. You're waiting for the second coming. But we know that they know that even though this is new, they're coming from what they know. We know where they've come from. We know the type of background they're from. So if we're looking at this thinking, how does this tell us about the perfect church? We also need to look at what their expectations of 
what we would call churches. This, the community they're used to, the fellowship they're used to. And that we know they've been brought up knowing that they are children of Abraham. That they are the people who Joseph took to Egypt. That they are the people who God saved from Egypt miraculously and gave Moses to lead them. They're the people who God, through Moses, gave the law. They're the people who were brought to the promised land. And they, they know that this is their calling. That's their understanding of their worshipping community. We can see it in, at the beginning of the Ten Commandments that Moses gave them. God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's how God starts the Ten Commandments. He identifies himself and then he identifies them. I'm God. I'm the God who saved you. You are the people who were saved. And so it's really quite easy to identify who these people are. They're the descendants of these people who are saved. And what should they do about it? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall worship me. God tells them, you are my people. You shall worship me. And he tells them how to worship him. He tells them obedience. Obey the law. So their form of worship is to meet in the synagogue to learn the, war, the law. They learn the law carefully. They obey the law. He calls them to offer sacrifices in the temple. He calls them to temple worship. This is in the background of Jesus' disciples. This is how they understand being a worshipping community. They understand community as a nation. They understand they are chosen by God. They understand that God acts. They are expecting a God who acts for his people. Jesus is creating a new thing, but it's still related to the old. It's growing out from the old thing. And the new thing, the big, big, big deal about the new thing is Jesus. It is Jesus who brings this new covenant, who moves them from the old covenant. Jesus is the big change. You just have to flick through Hebrews to see this. You don't have to flick through it. You can read through Hebrews if you like. But if you've got a Bible with you, you could just look through the chapters and see how it shows you how the old covenant has moved to the new covenant. So in chapter 1, it shows Jesus is supreme. Jesus is above all the angels. In chapter 2, it shows that Jesus is the founder of salvation. It's Jesus who brings salvation. In chapter 3, it shows Jesus is greater than Moses. That's very important if you've been living under the Old Covenant. Jesus is greater than Moses. In chapter 5 to 8, it shows Jesus is the high priest. All these roles under the New Covenant, Jesus is filling them all. Jesus is the high priest, and he's not just the high priest who performs the sacrifice. Jesus is the sacrifice. Chapter 10, he is the last sacrifice. He is the sacrifice once and for all. So the disciples are learning that it is no longer birth which gives them access, but faith in Jesus which gives them access. Paul sums it up in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God, through faith. For as many as you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promised. Christ is the change. Christ brings the change so that we can be adopted as children of God by faith in him. So that we become 
all one in Christ, united in Christ, so that we become heirs to the promise that was given to Abraham. Jesus does this new thing, and we are part of this new thing. We are called by him to be his people. It matters that we reach out to try to be what he calls us to be, to be the perfect church. Maybe perfect is too strong a word. Maybe we're setting it too high. But surely we must want to be the ch a church in the way Jesus wanted, in the way Jesus wants us to be. Baptized in the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, witnessing to his resurrection, preparing for his return. Are we? Are we empowered by the Holy Spirit? Jesus says we must be born again of water and the Spirit. This is available to all of us, that we can be born again of the Holy Spirit. Are we living in the power of the Holy Spirit? Are we relying on the Holy Spirit? Are we expecting his fruit in our lives? Are we expecting his gifts? Are we expecting miracles? Are we a church which is empowered by the Holy Spirit? Are we witnesses to his resurrection? Are we witnesses to Jesus? Well, pat on the back. Just being here this morning, that's a good start. We are witnessing to Jesus by gathering in his name. But there's more. Do we witness to Jesus in our work? in our families, with our neighbors? Do we witness in word, but do we witness in deed when, when we are living our lives? Are we witnessing to Jesus' resurrection? Is Jesus' resurrection power in our lives? Are we a church which truly witnesses to Jesus? I'm very grateful. I thank God for our sign outside. Love Jesus, live like Jesus, lead others to Jesus. That's a great witness. It's great. It's on all of our letterheads. It's on our websites. It's on our envelopes. It's powerful that we are witnessing to Jesus. We need to witness to Jesus in each part of our lives. Are we living in preparation for his return? Are we excited by the return of Jesus? Or are we, uh, are we dreading it a bit? Do you know, do we think, well, right now, I quite like my garden. I've got a lovely yard. I'm quite enjoying my children, my grandchildren. Don't come right now, Lord. I'm having fun. Because we can easily think like that, but the coming of Jesus is going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. It is going to be so much better than your backyard. It's going to be so much better than all the things we enjoy in life. It is something that we should be excited by. It is something that we should be loving and hoping for. When, when you look at the evil in the world, do you know, when you watch the news and you feel that despair where you think, what can possibly be done? It just seems to get worse and worse. Just imagine Jesus coming and washing it all clean. Just imagine Jesus washing away all tears, fixing all these problems. The second coming is something we should just be so delighted in. It's also something we should be living in preparation for each moment of each day are you coming now lord am i ready now am i quite ashamed of what i just did half an hour ago am i ready for jesus to come now there is so much to being jesus's church there's so much to trying to be the perfect church but let's forget perfection let's do a little straw poll imagine you walked out into the street and grabbed a stranger and you said, hey, I'm not from around here. I've never seen a church. What's a church? What do you think people would say if they were to give you a one or two word answer? What is a church? Go on. A building. Wouldn't a lot of people say a church is a building? Anything else? House of God. Community, maybe if they're reaching out. 
Do you think some people think the church is bishops and clergy? Do you, do you know, when they think of church, do you think there's some people who are like, yeah, I just see people processing in robes or, or something. Do you know, that kind of the, the structure of the church, the human structure of the church. Can you imagine going up to somebody and saying, hey, what's a church? And they say, the church is people empowered by the Holy Spirit to witness to the resurrection of Christ, preparing for his return. If somebody came up to you and said, what's a church? Is that how it would come out? The church is people empowered by the Holy Spirit to witness to the resurrection of Christ, preparing for his return. What would people say about Trinity Streetsville? So people tell me about Trinity Streetsville. It's kind of scary sometimes. So I, you're out in the street and you say, what, what defines Trinity Streetsville? What's, what's the thing that makes it different or what makes it stand out? What is Trinity Streetsville? Now, I don't want them to say, which is what a lot of people say to me, oh, that's that church that burnt down. <laughs> Do you know? That's the church that burnt down and they rebuilt. One fellow said to me, that's the church that burnt down and they rebuilt it. And do you know, inside it's identical to what it was before it was burnt down. <laughs> I didn't tell him. I was trying to be polite. I was like, there's a window. <laughs> we kept a window. And there's... Anyway, that's what he thought. I don't want them to say, that's that church with a limey for a minister. I've heard that one too. That's that church I went to once and it's got loud music and guitars and drums. It's not so bad. There's one people say that I kind of like, it's kind of cute. They say, oh, that's Hazel's church. Do, do you get that? That's quite nice. That's Hazel's church. That's the church where the minister refuses to wear a dress. I don't refuse. I just don't like it, you know. No, that's not what I want to hear people say about our church. I want them to say, oh, that's that church where they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't that be great? That's that church where they won't stop going on and on and on about Jesus and his resurrection. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the time. That's that church where they keep talking about the second coming, where they're anxious for Christ's return. And if that causes offense, I really want them to be offended. Do you know? This is somewhere where I'd be quite happy to offend folk. I don't want to offend people. There's so many ways to offend people, and I don't want to do those. Do you know? I don't want to offend people by being the unfriendly church, or the judgmental church, or the church that doesn't listen to people before they speak, or the church that doesn't care about people's backgrounds and sensitivities. Do you know? I want to be the church that does those things well. I don't want to be the church that offends people by having bad coffee. Not that we do. We have lovely coffee. Thank you very much for our coffee. We have great coffee. I don't want to be the church that offends people with accidents in pastoral care, which are usually my fault. I'm sorry. We're going to get better at that. I want them to say, they talk about the resurrection too much. It's all right, that church, but they're always talking about Jesus. I wish they'd stop talking about the second coming. I don't actually want them to be offended. I want them to stay. I want them to come to our church. I want them to be attracted to the wonder of a living relationship with Christ. But we must be the church that Christ has called us to be. Or it's all a waste of time. We must be the church Christ called us to be. Now there is more. There is more. There's a lot more to being the church Jesus has called us to be. That's why we're going to keep going through Acts and see even more of it. But this, this is the starting block that Jesus gives his disciples. He's spent the years with him. He's taught them. He's shown them his miracles. And as he's leaving them, he commissions them like this. Wait to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Witness to Jesus and his resurrection. Live in readiness for his return. That is his message to them. We are his disciples. This is our calling. This is what Jesus calls us to be. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, we want to be your people. We have heard your call on our lives. You call us to be here now. Lord, may we fulfill your calling on our lives. May we truly be empowered by your Holy Spirit. May we rely on your Holy Spirit. May we be driven by your Holy Spirit. May we see the fruit and the gifts that come from your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, make us true witnesses to you in every aspect of our lives. Grow us to be more like you, witnessing to you and the wonder of your resurrection. Lord Jesus, make us excited for your return. Lord Jesus, teach us to live in readiness for your return. Lord Jesus, work in this church, we pray. Move in each of us. Guide us. Guide us to grow your kingdom. For your glory, Lord. Amen.